It's all a dream. Yeah, just a dream. There's a whole world of difference between watching anime in the 2020s and watching anime in the 1990s, or hell, even the early 2000s, especially for those living in the West. What was once a niche, more adult-oriented subculture centered around catching glimpses of an exotic form of animation has now exploded into the international stage, reaching an incredible range of demographics, and is now far more mainstream than I think anyone at the time could have predicted. Back then, you'd have to scour late night TV in hopes of catching something, or dig around old shops for a poorly translated VHS tape that would probably turn out to be some kind of hentai. But now, it's easier than ever to watch anime, with entire companies and streaming services dedicated to localizing and releasing anime in the West. Today, if an anime is airing in Japan, it is now reasonable to expect that it will be officially localized and released, from the blockbusters and the franchises raking in millions, to the niche and experimental originals that no one's ever heard of, from the mediocre game and light novel adaptations that you've seen 50 times already, to the hentai and the- okay, I swear that's the last time I'm mentioning hentai. Long story short, anime is more accessible to people outside of Japan than it has ever been, and with that comes an unintended difference in how newer fans like myself watch anime compared to older fans. The increased accessibility has meant that we now experience firsthand the phenomenon of seasonal anime. Every time a new season rolls around, dozens of new series premiere, almost all of which are available on Crunchyroll or Funimation or Toonami within mere weeks, days, hours, minutes, or even immediately upon or even before their airing in Japan. Even if most of them don't appeal to you, there's bound to be at least a couple that catch your eye, or blow up to the point where you have to see what the fuss is about before the series ends and nobody is talking about it anymore. And before you know it, your MAL list is now filled with about 10 watchings and 20 planned to watches. To be fair, part of this is no doubt because more anime is being made in general, but the advent of streaming and the increased likelihood of localization has definitely helped speed things up dramatically. All this access to currently airing anime and the community pressure to watch it means that most people's time is going to be spent on them, and any shows that fall by the wayside are simply forgotten about, the time to watch them never found. And this unfortunately has an impact on anime that's especially old. I'm talking your Evangelions, your original Gundams, your Legend of the Galactic Heroes, shows like One Piece, Naruto, and Dragon Ball that have been running continuously since the Big Bang, even more comparatively recent and shorter classics like Serial Experiments Lane, Full Metal Alchemist, Code Geass, and Death Note. At one point, it was expected that everyone in the community knew about these shows and had watched them, but I think the era of anime being dominated by a list of giant, massively popular shows is coming to an end, simply due to the sheer number of anime being consumed right now. I wouldn't be surprised at all if modern anime's biggest hitters, Attack on Titan, Demon Slayer, My Hero Academia, and likely Chainsaw Man, also fall victim to this effect once they end, relegated to being cultural milestones and influences, famed for sure, but in practice being little more than museum pieces, to be gazed at and admired for their place in history, but no longer truly interacted with. But, provided you have the time, I think there's value in going back and watching the milestones you missed. Personally, I find it fascinating to go back to hallmarks in not just anime, but in all forms of art. To feel that eureka moment where you can see the influences it's had on your contemporary favourites. So I thought, hey, if I'm watching all these classics, I might as well make some content out of it. I think I'll make this a whole series. That might be fun. Like, comment, and subscribe for that. But I've already waffled on long enough. We have to start somewhere, don't we? And I suppose it's hard to pick a much better starting point than... I think it's time to blow this scene, get everybody in the stuff together. Okay, three, two...
I'm sure that giving an overview of Cowboy Bebop, thus implying you haven't heard of it, is downright insulting to a few of you, and in all fairness, I wouldn't blame you. You are a fucking hipster though. Cowboy Bebop is a sci-fi neo-noir space western that ran in 1998 and was created and animated at Studio Sunrise, who have animated several other highly regarded series, including the aforementioned Gundam and Code Geass. It's noticeable for being the solo directorial debut of now industry legend Shinichiro Wanatabe, who would go on to direct shows like Samurai Champloo, Space Dandy, Terror in Resonance, and Carol in Tuesday, at least one of which I'm probably going to have to dedicate a future video to. But even compared to those, it cannot be underestimated how big this was. While shows like Attack on Titan and One Punch Man helped anime explode into the mainstream, it was Cowboy Bebop that helped lay the foundations upon which they stood. Even to this day, it continues to be recommended as a gateway into the medium for newcomers. When it comes to critical acclaim, you can't get much more than that. But does it deserve it? After all, it's been over 20 years since the series first premiered. How has it aged? Well, poorly. Has it aged at all? After two decades, does Cowboy Bebop hold up? Let's find out. Oh, and it goes without saying, but spoilers for most, if not all, of Cowboy Bebop. I'll try and avoid them up to a certain point, but no promises. If you haven't seen the show, go watch it, then come back. Trust me, you won't regret it. I suppose there's no better place to start than the premise. Cowboy Bebop follows the crew of the... The Bebop, consisting of bounty hunters Spike Spiegel and Jet Black. Later expanding to include Data Dog and resident good boy Ayn, fellow bounty hunter Faye Valentine, and hacker Edward Wong How Pep... 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 Edward Wong How... Pep... Pepe? Edward Wong Howe Pepeluchivruski the fourth. Ed made it up, you know. Cheers, Edward. For the most part, the series is quite episodic, barring some noticeable exceptions. Though there is an obvious sense of progression, a fair amount of the first 23 episodes are mostly standalone, and could probably be watched and enjoyed in isolation without getting too confused, a consequence of Cowboy Bebop's general approach to story and world building, namely, it being extremely character driven, with any forward momentum in the overarching plot coming entirely from them. And this was definitely the right decision, because the heart of Cowboy Bebop is without a doubt its characters, who, even 20 years later, form one of the strongest, most iconic casts in anime. I don't really like describing things as cool, but when talking about Spike, it's almost impossible to use any other word. Spike is cool. He sounds cool, he acts cool, he fights cool, he looks cool, despite the fact that he was designed to look uncool. The man is just frosty as fuck. I was actually kind of worried that he'd be too cool, almost like a Gary Stu type, and maybe he would be in today's climate full of self-inserts. But trust me, that ain't Spike. It's hard to go into what makes his character great without going deep into the themes of the series as a whole, so I'll just put him aside for now and say that, episode to episode, he is one entertaining son of a bitch. Besides, the other characters give plenty to chat about. Though most of the characters are adults, it's Jet that feels the most like the group dad, which makes sense given he's the oldest. I actually found him to be the most relatable, since he's generally the most cool-headed, wry, and the most mature, though compared to these jokers that might not be saying much. It's obvious through not just his design, but even through how he's written and how he handles himself that he's lived the most, that he has the most experience, and that gives him a fun kind of exasperation different from Spike's world weariness. More on that later. Out of the whole crew, he might just be my favourite character, though the others definitely give him a run for his money. So you know how I literally just said Jet was my favourite character? I think I might need to add an asterisk to that. Jet is my favourite character. 
but he's not the best written character in my opinion, an honour that could very possibly go to Faye, especially when it comes to the direction of her arc. Like Spike, her character and the journey she goes on actively feeds into the story's themes. Faye is confident and seductive, taking no bullshit from anyone, but also kind of petulant and slobbish, which makes her hilarious when bouncing off the other crew members. She's an absolute treat to watch, and only partially because of her looks, and the way her backstory and character unfolds leaves her in a magnificent place. Okay, so you know how I just said that Faye was the best written character? No, 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 she is. I kid, I kid. Well... Ed is... Ed is... Ed is... Huh. Um... Ed is... Uh... Ed is Ed, and that is honestly the most appropriate way to describe her. She is just... fucking nuts. I'm actually struggling to come up with the right words. I imagine some might find her childish, absurd antics annoying, especially since she's the only child in a cast full of adults, and to be fair, it is hard to imagine a character like her showing up in a more modern anime of similar tone and cast. But... <laughs> I'm sorry, she's just so much fun. She's so unapologetically her that she's honestly more endearing than anything. And having such an innocent character in the cast does help to brighten things up, especially when the other main characters consist of three clinically depressed adults. Oh, and Ayn. Ayn is the bestest boy. I suppose the one thing I don't like about Ed is that in the back of my mind, I couldn't shake the knowledge that her design, as good as it is, could be very easily shown in a... Not ad friendly way if the show had ended up in the wrong pair of hands. <laughs> oh, I know what you're thinking. Oh, Kai, you're just being sick and stupid. Listen, I have been watching anime for years and I have been trained to expect the absolute worst from this medium. I can trust nothing. I've seen things whelp, seen things that would drive the ill-prepared to insanity, I've seen true degeneracy, and I'm not even talking about hentai, no, I- To, to the, the hentai, hentai and the- okay, okay, I swear, that's, swear the that's the last, last time, time I'm mentioning hentai. hentai. God, I hate anime. Oh. So those were the main characters, but Bebop is populated with a variety of others, from the reoccurring to the one-off, with most of them standing out well and leaving a great impression in their own right. From de facto antagonist Vicious, who looks like the main villain to a B-list Tim Burton film, to VT, to those random old guys who keep showing up, to my personal favourite, Mad Pirot. He's just such a morbid character. Especially once you realise how tragically childlike and innocent he is. While we're still on the subject of characters, I'd like to talk a little bit about representation. One thing that really stood out to me as I watched CB is how diverse the world is. The ethnic backgrounds of the Bebop crew are unclear, though Faye is implied to be from Singapore and Spike is unintentionally Jewish coded. However, there is no doubt that they truly live in a multicultural world, with the same cultures that once populated the Earth now filling the stars. It's barely ever focused on, but... I like it. It's nice, and you can tell that the cultures shown were generally researched and respected well. A big part of the show's identity comes from jazz, after all, a genre born of black musicians. And while it's not always perfect, with the black exploitation influences of mushroom samba feeling a little dated by today's standards, for example, for a Japanese production in the 90s, it ain't half bad. Better than some anime today, at least. <laughs> Let's just get on to the animation.
When it comes to Cowboy Bebop's animation, I have, essentially, nothing to complain about. Despite having come out over 20 years ago, and despite all the advancements in animation made since, CB still holds up as one of the most consistently well-animated television anime ever. It's old enough to have the charm of that antiquated, slightly rough hand-drawn style that's been lost in favour of the clean, computer-assisted animation of today, but it's not so old that it suffers from the stiffer animation of even older shows. It hits a nice sweet spot that draws on the strengths of the series that came before and would come after, though this is undoubtedly less to do with the time period and more to do with the strength of the crew making it. The character designs, while occasionally a little ridiculous, are all drawn consistently on model, and other than a couple of dated effects, there was never a shot that looked bad to me. If there was one thing about the show's animation that I had to criticise, it would maybe be a few instances of weird compositing and the rare use of CGI, which hasn't aged very well. But taking into account when the show came out and how little CGI is actually used, it's really just a nitpick. Speaking of, an area where Cowboy Bebop doesn't use CGI is with its ships and the various space battles across the series. Which, if you've seen your share of anime in the past decade or so, you know is an increasingly rare sight. CGI has become a far more common feature, especially in regards to its usage for vehicles, ships, mechs, or anything just too complex and or big that moves too much. And now, it's not uncommon for entire shows to be CGI. And like, yeah, I get it. These things take fucking forever to animate by hand, throw in the cumbersome, massive, often heavily detailed designs of stuff like ships and mechs, and there's a reason that Sunrise are the only ones still consistently animating them by hand. And despite what the old stigma will tell you, CG allows for animation just as jaw-dropping as hand-drawn. Having said that, the hand-drawn ships in Bebop are a special rarity in today's world and lend to the show's unique look, whereas if it were made today, they would undoubtedly be CG. The style might be unsustainable now, but Bebop is a brilliant reminder of what was once possible even for TV. Of course, good animation is lovely and all, but what really makes a show pop and stand out is its style and direction. And if you're looking for style, then Bebop has that in spades. Influences taken from a variety of places, old westerns, samurai cinema, film noir, all those come together here to create a show that wears its inspirations on its sleeve, but still forges its own identity. Direction ranges from minimal and understated with the naturalism of a drama, to a dramatic grandiosity that makes you think you're watching some kind of art house prestige show, to the ridiculous charm of a Saturday morning cartoon, the show strikes a balance between obviously being made for adults, whilst still not being so mature that it's off-putting to younger audiences. Whatever tone a scene has, the style and direction of CB is almost never not striking and engaging, featuring some of the best shots I've ever seen in the medium. This nice range in direction is also extended to its fight scenes. During the more comedic, lighter moments, fights can take on a playful air with elaborate choreography and set pieces that make great use of the animated format. The more serious moments have this as well, but strip away the playful atmosphere almost entirely. A lot of the time, music just doesn't play at all, and the choreography changes from dynamic and zany to realistic and meandered. Either way, it's always a spectacle. A spectacle in no small part due to the iconic score by Yuko Kano and her band Seatbelts. Yeah, I know I just said some fights don't even have music, but um, fuck you. Drawing its influence from all over, but primarily bebop, western, and opera, CB's soundtrack is arguably just as iconic as the show itself. Ranging from the playful, to the dramatic, to the mournful, to the toe-tapping, to the whatever Cats on Mars is, never does a track feel out of place. Though there are many songs to like, such as the iconic opening and ending themes Tank and the Real Folk Blues, as well as the series ending theme Blue, my personal favourite track has to be Space Lion. This atmospheric, spacey blues number that transitions into these drums, bass and spiritual vocals, it just generates such fantastic imagery and emotion for me. It makes me feel like I'm floating in a ship through the universe with all the melancholia and wonder that entails. This kind of music isn't one you usually hear in anime, back then or today, and with its influences from westerns, a genre that doesn't really get the same attention it used to, it has an interesting, almost archaic vibe to it. 
It's really in a league of its own, and the beautiful jazz numbers in particular keep me coming back again and again. However, some of the tracks used remain unreleased even today, such as the ominous Space Temple, which appears to be Vicious' theme. I'm not sure why they were never released, but it's an absolute shame, and I can only hope that one day they see the light of day. I think I've gone over everything I can in terms of more presentation, surface level stuff. Premise, music, animation, direction. I think it's time we get to the meat of things, no? I've tried to dance around major spoilers so far, but now they're unavoidable, so if you've made it this far and you still haven't finished Cowboy Bebop, your loss, I guess. I mentioned a few minutes ago that Bebop was a show made for adults, and I cannot overstate that. While it isn't impossible for teenagers to enjoy it, I imagine a lot of people were exposed to it at that age, I don't think CB really speaks to you until you've lived a little, or have gone through some heavy shit in the past. In a way, I'm almost glad it took me so long to get around to properly watching it. Though I'm still quite young myself, I've grown and matured so much in the past year, let alone since I left high school, and I think the person I was back then, though they would have liked it, wouldn't have really connected with the show as I did when I finally watched it. I think Cowboy Bebop is ultimately about the past. More specifically, the hold that the past can have on a person, and the different ways it drags us down. From the beginning, the past is something that clearly has a hold over Spike, Faye and Jet, though only glimpses are shown to us and the other characters, something I really like. These characters went through deeply personal, often traumatic events, so it makes sense that they would be reluctant to talk about it. There's no big scene where everyone cries and opens up about their feelings, we're given snippets, glimpses, scenes, some longer than others and we're able to piece these clues together to form an image of the person they used to be. Sometimes we're not even given the full picture. It's up to us to fill in the gaps ourselves. Jet is someone who wears his past on his sleeve. Pardon the pun. His missing arm is a constant reminder for him not just of what his past took from him, but also the lingering influence it still has in his life. Not to mention his past as a police officer constantly coming into play, often using it to get info out of old acquaintances. Ironically though, despite having the most visible baggage, Jet is really the only one of the three who actually faces their past in a more or less mature fashion and actually gets some kind of closure. He's able to move on from his ex-lover, he finds closure over a friend through his daughter, he confronts the man who took his arm. There are probably many more instances that we never see, but by the series' end, it seems like Jet is the only one who's genuinely trying to put it all behind him and move on. Faye goes on a similar kind of arc, though hers is a lot more detailed and a lot messier. Unlike the two men who are haunted by the thick fog of yesteryear, Faye's issue is the exact opposite. She has no past. She has no place she can really point to and say, this is where I came from, or this is my home. No life that she can say she's lived. No identity to lay claim to, other than the one that she constructs herself. After remembering the person she lost, the person she was supposed to be, her first reaction is to try and go back, embrace the warm, fuzzy image of the past and just stay in that world forever. But she can't. There's nothing there for her. It's not her home anymore. It's not the home of the Faye Valentine she is now. Rather than anchor her, give her a sense of belonging and stability, knowing her past makes Faye realise that the only place she can really call home is the one that she made for herself in the present. The Bebop. On the other hand, we have Ed, and unlike the others, we aren't even really given a hint at her backstory until her final episode. And that's for the simple reason that Ed doesn't really give a shit. The past isn't something she once brings up or for that matter, the future either. And why would she? She's a kid. She doesn't really have a past to haunt her, and she's not in a position where she needs to think of the future. She's just like most children, living in an eternal present, doing before thinking, not a care in the world, nothing holding her down. And finally, Spike. Spike isn't just haunted by the past, he is still in the past. 
In many ways, he died when he left the Red Dragon Syndicate, and what is left is just a husk sleepwalking through life. The nonchalance he displays isn't just him being cool, he genuinely doesn't care about the now or the future. He's just… tired, living through the world's longest, most boring dream, unable to wake up until the end. Shinichiro Wanatabe has said that Spike's death is meant to be ambiguous, but while I'm a big fan of positive, life-affirming messages, I really think that this is where his story ends. It's very depressing, but I honestly struggle to see him finding a normal way to move on like Jet. Maybe several years down the line, but I really think that this is the only way he could have found peace. For some reason, it just feels right that the only way he'd ever feel alive again is once everything from his past, including himself, is dead and buried. I think these timeless, painfully relatable themes and characters are why Cowboy Bebop has aged so well, and why it continues to be enjoyed by people new to anime and people who saw it decades ago when it first came out. The music, the animation, the direction, the world, all of it would have cemented its status as a cult classic, but its message and heart are what elevated it to become a legend, paving the way for series to come and continuing to stand among them. Bang. So, going back to the titular question, does Cowboy Bebop hold up today? No. Well, right, fine, yes. Cowbop B-Boy is fucking good. Even taking into account its age and comparing it to some of the best that modern anime has to offer, it still holds. Any aspects of it that might be dated are more than compensated for by its strengths, and anyone who is a fan of anime, westerns, noir, music, or just good TV, I would highly recommend they give it a shot. 9 out of 10. Needed more Spike and Ed. Well, I think that's it. Unless there's something I'm forgetting to talk about? No? I think that's it. And so brings this little retrospective to an end. Well, I say little, but this will without a doubt be my longest video so far, and if you've reached this point, thank you very much for sticking. I appreciate it. If you enjoyed it, then like, comment, share, subscribe, consider donating to my Ko-fi, or even pledging to my Patreon. You get credits in my videos, an early look at things like thumbnail ideas and video progression, and a director's commentary for each video. Also, if you enjoyed this kind of video, then be sure to comment on what series you'd like me to take a look at next. What classic deserves a reappraisal? I've already got an idea of my own, but I'd love to hear some suggestions as well. Once again, like, share, subscribe, and I'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Wait. Wait, 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 I forgot- I, I forgot the fucking film, Jesus- oh. Cowboy Bebop, uh, d d knocking on heaven's door, um, uh, film, uh, it came out a few years after, set during, um, uh, between episodes 21, 20, 22, I believe, uh, that's when I watched it, uh, yeah, it's nice, good, good film, um, um, it feeds in very good with the, th the themes and that, um, I like the, I, li I like the butterflies and that, um, definitely watch it, where, it, it, canonically, don't wait, I mean, you can wait up until after you've seen it, but I would recommend watching it in order, uh, uh, it's a very good film, uh, by itself, 8 out of 10, uh, good stuff, uh, bye, subscribe, uh, watch, uh, share, give me money.